Well, if you have your Bibles, open to the book of John, please. Book of John, if you have your Bibles. Last Sunday night service of 2019. So all the things I've wanted to say all year, I can say tonight, and we should probably go all the way to 2020 tonight. So that'll be great. We'll just, wouldn't it be great to stay in church till 2020? Yeah, some of you liars out there. <laughs> I don't want to stay in 2020, man. John chapter number 15, though. John chapter 15. We finish up this year. I want to take us back to where we began the year, and that's with our theme plastered all over the place. Help me here. I'm going to just say a few phrases, and each, each phrase I'd like you to say our theme, which is continue. All right, John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Would you say that last phrase with me? For without me ye can do nothing. Absolutely nothing can be done without Jesus Christ. It's what he says. Without me ye can do some things. You can do a little bit. No, he says without me you can do nothing. You say, well, Pastor Howell, that's not true. I, I drove the church tonight and I didn't involve the Lord at all. You're right. And nothing profitable was done without him. You mean he cares about, about how I drive? You bet he does. Without me, nothing can be done that is profitable, that is fruit-bearing. Without me, ye can do nothing. Well, Pastor Howell, that's not true. I, uh, last week, I, you know, I, I had some time and I didn't spend a single day with him. And boy, we had just a great Christmas. Unfortunately, that happens. I take you back to this verse. Without me, ye can do nothing. Tonight, I want to challenge us to, uh, what's the word, our theme? Continue. This year at First Baptist Church, we had a huge transition. What should we do? Continue. Life may throw us a curveball in 2020. What should we do? Continue. When things don't make sense, what God has called us to follow, we ought to continue. When we feel like quitting, we should continue. When we don't understand, we ought to continue. A man living in the third century was dying when he wrote these last words to a friend. He wrote this, it's a bad, bad world, an incredibly bad world, but I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and a holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. They are truly a joyful people. These people are called Christians, and I am one of them. Tonight, I want to challenge us out of John 15, 1 through 5, that word abide. We saw it in the New Testament, another place where it also says to continue to remain, to stay in Jesus, to continue this year. As we finish out the year, if I can give us one thought for 2019, I hope that you and I, help me, continue. You see, next Sunday, Lord willing, we'll launch our new theme. Those signs you see around us will all be gone. The continue will not be there any longer. But though it may not be on the walls, I hope it lives on in our lives. I hope we don't just walk away and say, well, that was great. Next up, we ought to continue. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help on the service tonight. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for Jesus and for his power. Lord, I pray you'd help us now as we look at this passage. Lord, that you touch our hearts. Lord, that you would show us the ways that maybe we have not been pleasing to you. Lord, help us as we finish out 2019 to begin 2020 with a clear conscience, with a clear direction. May it all revolve around you. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. I wonder uh, as we go through the next week or so, uh, what your reflection on this past year will look like. Often, end of the year becomes a time to set New Year resolutions. Famous New Year resolutions often involve saving money, and losing weight, not necessarily in that order. 
When I was going to the YMCA, uh, it seemed like every January you'd have the, as we call them, the resoluters would show up. And they'd come popping into the YMCA in their brand new workout clothes. Often it seemed like the tag was either still on there or the creases from the folds were still in the clothes like that. You'd watch these resoluters jump onto a machine sometimes and boy the machines have never strained at such speed they'd go very quickly for it. At least 30 seconds it seemed like. It was during this time of the Y and Brother Mitchell, you still go there, right? And you know this, the weights are in all a disarray. People will jump on a weight bench and start throwing up weight all over the place and with good intentions, right? Good intentions, excellent intentions. Get healthy and try to live longer and have a good quality of life and it seems like, oh, crash and burn. And uh, the regulars, when I was there, the regulars, we'd say, well, give it about three weeks and we'll be back to our same old, same old crew there. But to be a time to reflect and maybe a time to, to look at some New Year resolutions, some New Year decisions, and I'm not here to say what you ought or not to do tonight, but I, I'm going to challenge you to do this one thing, and that's to continue, to abide in Jesus Christ, to not just have it as a theme this year, but to move forward as a church in our life. You see, Jesus says in verse number one, I am the true vine. There are many things in life that will claim to be true, that will claim to give you what Jesus says, I will do for you. He says in this passage, like John duplicates in the book of 1 John, if you do this, your joy might be full. Verse number 11, remember a life that is full of just joy, overbrimming with joy, a life that that is happy, that is fulfilled, that is satisfied. This joy in verse 11 is not is not this deep-seated joy that we want to adopt as Christians sometimes. That that deep-seated joy that says, well, pastor, I just have so much joy. It's so deep that I'm hiding it from you. Oh, come on. That's not what we're called to be as Christians. Now, there are times that life throws a curveball and there is a a peace that passes all understanding as we follow Jesus Christ. But what John is talking about is when you abide in Jesus Christ, when you walk in Christ, when you live in Christ, when you continue in Christ, you know what? Life is going to look pretty good. All right, you're going to walk around with a smile on your face and a song in your heart. And, And even when life doesn't seem to line up like you think it'll line up. And that's why you can see some Christians who go through maybe some tragedy but still walk through with a smile on their face and a song in their heart because they have some joy. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Nothing else is true besides Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth. Oh, well, see advertisements for true things, but Jesus is the only advertisement for truth. In this passage, I see a few things for us tonight. As we look at how to continue or how to abide in Jesus Christ as we finish out this year and go into 2020, the first thing I see is a purifying. And in verse number three, he says this. He says, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. We have, we have been made clean because of Jesus Christ. Once dirty, now clean. Once filthy, now washed. So can I say this? Quit trying to be dirty. Because Jesus has cleansed us through his word. That's what he says. All right, so as we abide in Jesus, we continue in Jesus, quit trying to get the filth of this world on you and try to walk with Jesus. I have the privilege of having a car wash subscription. Subscriptions for everything in 2020, right? Right? You know, if you cut the cord to, to cable things, you get the subscription to this or to this or, and to music services, and they want to nickel and dime you to death, and they do that with your car wash too. And someone gave me information about, about Mr. Car Wash, formerly known as Firehouse, right? For a few dollars a month, you can wash your car all the time. I signed up for it. I wash my car regularly. I like a clean car. But I've noticed something. As I go on that, I, I see a, a speck of dirt or a little, little salt on my truck, and I'm like, i got to get the thing clean. As I go into the car wash, I see the vehicles around me. And you know what's odd? That most of the vehicles going into the car wash are already pretty clean. But I pass a few down, down the road who need to go to Mr. Car Wash. But they haven't been to Mr. Car, they haven't been to car Wash in years, have they? And the ones that need to go through the car wash aren't going through the car wash. They're driving past the car wash. Can I say sometimes that's the same with Christians? All right, the ones who need the cleansing of Jesus Christ 
are the ones going through the car wash. I want to be clean in 2019. I want to stay clean. Once dirty, now clean. So I don't want to quit trying to be dirty. You know, with little kids, they can seem to find the mud piles faster than anyone else, can't they? The road looks smooth. The sidewalk looks clear, but they're walking and boom. Now they're dirty. Maybe you've had someone come to your house to sell you a vacuum cleaner. They say, well, let me vacuum your rug. You just vacuumed it, right? Let me vacuum. Let me show you how bad your vacuum is. You with me? Don't show me. I don't want to know how bad it is. Let me remain in my filth and in ignorance in my house. They do that. They hit one spot. I'm just kidding. When I read this, you've heard about taking probiotics, healthy bacteria for healthy gut, right? You hear about that? You know, you take this thing to make sure that you're healthy. But there's a, there's a new one out there, Dave Whitlock, a chemical engineer and MIT grad, believes that you ought to replace the bacteria that's been stripped away by what he views as excessive cleansing. So he developed a product that will spray live bacteria onto your skin. And here's the real thing, he says, restoring the proper level of bacteria on your skin means kissing, his words, all those baths and showers goodbye. As a matter of fact, he boasts, I have not taken a shower in over 12 years. We live in 2020 almost. We have running water. Praise God for that. Take a shower. Defending this unorthodox conviction has led him to co-found this company. He believes since we don't spend as much time outdoors as we used to, we need to reconnect with our environment by reintroducing dirt back into our lives. So the product they created was, is called Mother Dirt. Live bacteria that is sprayed directly under the skin twice a day. They explain the benefits. Our users are cutting out or cutting down on deodorant, moisturizers. There's even a mother dirt shampoo and cleanser that promises not to remove bacteria. What will they think of next? <laughs> the truth is, with Jesus Christ, we've been cleansed. And when he was talking to Peter, he said, You don't need me to wash all of you all over again, but just your feet. You've been removed from the penalty of sin, but sometimes you're touched by the effects of sin. So make sure we're, we're cleansed this year and, and, and purified, Ephesians 5, 25 to 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle, any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You're purified. You and I are purified. So quit trying to be dirty. I was a young child, and I had at Christmas time, this time of year, the flu. I think my mother's watching now on live stream. She's a little, a little bug this past week. We had some family coming to my house, and so my mother was concerned about the effects of my particular stomach virus when our family was coming into town, my grandfather, one of them. I remember one point running to the bathroom and losing my, my lunch or whatever it was, whatever's in my stomach. Can I just say this? I hate vomiting. I hate it. But my mother was so concerned about the sickness that she followed me from the bathroom to my bedroom with a can of Lysol, spraying everything that I, she says, touched. I say looked at. <laughs> I think, I feel like she sprayed me, Brother John, all right? All I know is when I got back to my bed, she'd sprayed so much with such a cloud of this Lysol mist and affected me so much that I immediately ran back to the bathroom and threw up again. And I think she followed me again to spray everything down. I'm so glad that we have the life solved, the Word of God. Cleanse us. You want to continue? Continue on continuing? You stay right here in the Word this end of this year and the next year. You stay here. Let His Word cleanse you and make you clean. And quit, quit, quit trying to be dirty. It's a purifying. But I also see in verse number four a positioning. 
Where Jesus says, abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. We cannot bear fruit apart from Jesus Christ. There is nothing we can do, like he says at the end, without Jesus Christ. One of the hardest things that we will do is to learn to rely upon Jesus Christ. We get so consumed with our own thoughts, our own actions, and if you're not careful, you can walk through a part of the day or a whole day or a whole week or a month and not even involve Jesus Christ, the one who promises power and promises his help. You can go to work and work all day and realize, boy, I did it all myself. I didn't abide in Jesus. I pray before I preach service because I don't want to stand up here and preach without Jesus Christ. So my mouth can move, but I need the power of God through my life. You sit there as you listen. You ought to ask Jesus, help me to listen. Without me, ye can do nothing. You see, the, ha- the problem is, it is opposite of what we see every day. Earthly life goes from dependency to independency. Uh, uh, earthly life, you have a small child who can't do anything, and hopefully you eventually say, hey, now you can walk, you can eat, you can work, you can support yourself. And earthly life goes from dependency to independency. Spiritual life goes from independent, once in control, now I'm dependent on Jesus Christ. I had the joy of having my sister and brother-in-law and my new little niece, about 14 months now, Audrey Grace with us, and she has just been a doll. I mean, it's just, oh, she's just all smiles. And I don't ever remember my kids being that happy, but Audrey Grace is just, little Grace, she's just, a, it's been so much fun. And my brother-in-law here tonight, and, and Audrey's been feeling a little bit under the weather, but just, just fun to watch her run around the house again. My kids are older now, right? I don't have to hold Johnny's hand when he walks through the house. He's 11 now. But little Audrey, boy, she, she you hold your hand and go up down the steps. But every once in a while, she gets that idea, she can do this, right? You reach out that hand, and she kind of like turns aside goes, I got this, Mom. I got this, Dad. You know, uh, we, we hope that uh, over the next few years, she continues to walk all by herself, right? Hopefully five years from now, uh, ten years from now, we're not saying, all right, Audrey, let me, let me help you as you walk down the steps. Yet in our spiritual life, it's exactly the opposite. We're supposed to learn how to depend upon Jesus Christ. Here's a question for you. How close are you to Jesus Christ? Are you holding his hand? Are you, are, you, are you reaching up for it? Those little times when she needs help, she just, about this tall, little blonde hair, this little, and just cute little girl, she reached up that little hand like this. Boy, it'd be good for us just to reach up our little hand to our Savior. Say, Jesus, help me step down this step. Help me step into this store. Help me as I go tomorrow. Help me as I work through this problem. Help me. I see positioning. There's a young man named Roscoe. He was arrested for drunk driving in Kentucky. He pled guilty, and the judge sentenced him to community service. Well, when Roscoe showed up at the jail to begin his sentence, the sheriff informed him that he would be painting a yellow line down the middle of a newly constructed road. The sheriff purchased several gallons of yellow paint and a dozen paint rollers, and Roscoe began his task. The first day, as the story goes, Roscoe painted the line two miles down the road. And the sheriff was more than impressed. But on the second day, Roscoe only painted the line one mile further. And the sheriff was still satisfied but less impressed. On the third day, Roscoe only covered a quarter of a mile. Now the sheriff apparently was upset and he decided to talk to Roscoe. He said, you haven't been painting as much road as you did on the first day. What's the problem? Roscoe replied, I'd be painting more, but the bucket keeps on getting farther and farther away. I'd be doing more for Jesus, but he keeps on getting farther and farther away. You can abide with him and in him. You can continue with him. The position to abide in Jesus Christ, Hudson Taylor said this to his sister, Oh, it is a joy to feel Jesus living in you. To find your heart all taken up by him, to be reminded of his love by his seeking communion with you at all times, not by your painful attempt to abide in him. He is our life, our strength, our salvation, our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification and redemption. He is our power for service and fruit bearing. And in his bosom is our resting place now and forever. 
I read this quote from someone else. Once a man is united to God, how could he not live forever? Very true. Once we're united with Christ in salvation, how could we not live forever? They finish the quote this way. Once a man is separated from God, what can he do but wither and die? Maybe the problem at home is that you're not abiding with Jesus Christ. Maybe the problem with your job is you're not abiding with Christ. Maybe you're just withering and dying because the bucket's three and a quarter miles down the road. I see a purifying, I see a positioning. But then in verse number five, I see a prospering. Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I am him, the same bringeth forth. You see the next word on the screen or in your Bibles? What does it say? Much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. How much fruit does, does God promise if we abide in him? Help me, the word is much. Not, not, a, not a scarcity, not one or two. He says, if ye abide in me, the same bringeth forth much fruit fruit, many fruit, large fruit, so much that God has for us. With Jesus, anything is possible. Uh, I'm not old enough. With Jesus, anything is possible. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not talented enough. But with Jesus, he says, it's not about you. It's about me. With Jesus, anything is possible. Well, pastor, that person will never see Christ. That person will never trust him as their savior. But with Jesus, anything is possible. Without me, you can do nothing. But with me, you will bring forth much fruit. You say, but it's hard. But with Jesus, anything is possible. So continue. But with Jesus, I have potential. You don't know my background. You're right, I don't. You don't know mine. You don't know the choices I've made. You're right. Jesus doesn't. With him, anything is possible. I see in this verse nothing about background, nothing about choices, except the choice to abide in Jesus. And he says, if you do that, the potential is for you, for this church, for this city to be touched by the power of Jesus. There is so much potential there. As a professor in a college ethics class, he presented his students with a problem. He said, a man has syphilis, and his wife has tuberculosis. They have four children. One has died. The other three have what is considered to be a terminal illness. The mother is pregnant again. What do you recommend? When the secular college, among unsafe people, after a spirit discussion, the majority of the class voted that she should abort the child. Fine, said the professor, But understand that you've just killed Beethoven. You see, God can do great things with what the world would reject and judge as premature and worthless. As far as God is concerned, every life is a Beethoven. We all have equal value and potential to him. With Jesus, I have potential. I don't care how old you are or how much talent you think or you have or don't have. God can take what you have. He works through you, and he will let you bring forth much fruit, much fruit in your Sunday school class and much fruit in your bus route, much fruit at home with your neighbors. He brings potential. Last is this with Jesus. Not only is anything possible and I have potential, but with Jesus, I am profitable. Without him, I have no profit, but with Jesus, I am profitable. If you were to Google this, you can do it later. I Googled this. How to make your business more profitable. The response was 130 million pages in a little over half a second. I did not read all of them. First one, 13 ways to make your business more profitable. 15 ways, to, simple ways to make your business more profitable. And the ways, I started to read some of them, and the ideas they had. Have your customers buy three more percent, pay 10% late, and or all these crazy things to make it more profitable this coming year. My favorite one, allow someone else to run it. <laughs> That'll do it. How about one way to make your life profitable? Allow someone else to run it. Because when you run it and when I run it, no profit. When he runs it, it's profitable. It'll be good for something. I don't want to get to heaven, stand for Christ, and realize that I wasted my life. 
I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've taken what I've given you, you used it for me, and I used it, and I made it profitable. I see a purifying, and I see a positioning, and I see a pruning. Verse number two, and one and two, actually, where he said, I'm the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me and that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. There's a, a pruning that happens. I don't begin to know exactly everything that Christ is saying here. There's been many theories that have been floated about this passage, these two verses actually. Some would even go so far as to say that if we're not bearing food for Christ, that he, when he says taketh away, that he actually removes us from this earth. I don't know if that's exactly what he's saying or not, but I do see right here that, that what he says is that if you bear fruit, I'll do something to help you bear more fruit. He prunes the ones who are trying to live for him. It is because of fruit that I can bear more fruit. You ever wonder sometimes why it seems like the people who are, are living for Christ are being pruned, right? And those who don't live for Christ have no problems at all? This verse right here, he says, if you bear fruit, then my Father will prune that, and he's going he's gonna to make it so that you'll be even more productive and more profitable. The thought, well, look at them, they're, they're not even living for God, and, and nothing is happening in their life. You're exactly right. But the nothing that you're referring to is different than the nothing that I'm referring to. The nothing you're saying is, well, God's not touching them. God's not judging them. And I would say that, but nothing's happening. No reward, no profitability. There's a pruning. I see in the pruning, first of all, a process. It takes time and is careful attention. At our house, before we moved to this one on Morris Road, we had a couple apple trees. And your husband... See, Mrs. Kissy down here, he helped me with the apple trees. They, the one had, had become a little overgrown, and my wife, it kind of been kind of an eyesore in the backyard, so I decided to prune it myself. I don't know how to prune apple trees. Having done it, I still don't know how to prune apple trees. When I got done with that process, the tree was smaller. Isn't that the purpose of pruning it, to make the tree smaller? Don't look at me like an idiot, because I was an idiot that day. But for whatever reason, that next year, that, that tree produced, what, honey, maybe three or four apples, all of it. The one I didn't touch had a, a, load of, a load of apples. It was at that point that Brother Kisser did not allow me to touch my apple trees anymore. It was a wise man. He and his wife came over, and they did some things to it. And, and uh, boy, you know why? Because I'm not very good at trimming apple trees. And I'm not really good at pruning my own life. But he is. He is. He knows what to snip, how to snip, and how to trim it just right so that my life and your life can bear even more fruit. It's a process. But can I say this? Sometimes it's painful. I'll be honest with you. On a spiritual level, I don't like to be pruned spiritually. I like me just the way I am. I would dare say that's most of us, if not all of us. I don't like the pruning process. There's been times the Lord's been pruning me and taking me through a particular trial or test, and, and you're like, Lord, I don't want to learn this thing. I don't want my faith to be increased in this way. Paul, where he says, I've learned how to abound and be abased, right? Speaking of financial things, most of us can, can uh, identify with the abased. I'm happy to learn how to abound next. Lord, give me so much money so I don't know what to do with it. I'll learn that lesson. But the Lord knows exactly what lesson he wants to take us through. And sometimes it's painful. I may not like to be pruned, but I'll tell you what. My wife wants me to be pruned. Not, not in, a, in a joking way, but, but does she not want a husband who pleases the Lord the best way possible? I want my wife to be pruned. Uh, not me doing it. I'm a terrible pruner. He's a good one. I want my kids to be pruned. They want their dad to be pruned. Listen, I don't want to be pruned, but, but I think you as a church want the pastor to be pruned, to be the best profitable pastor, not for my sake, your sake, but for his sake. And, and I desire for you to be pruned. Sometimes it's painful. 
Sometimes you're not going to like the branch that he wants to cut off. Lord, not this branch. You can have this one over here. I'll give you those, but, but not this one. This is my special branch. I've, I've mentored this branch for a long time. I've, I've hit it. I've covered it. And the husbandman, the father, in his wisdom, in his security and his knowledge says, but I need that one right there. Because when I get that one right there, you will bear even more fruit. It's a process. It's painful. But last of all, there's a promise. Because he says, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. He says that when he's done, <clears throat> we're not done. When he's done, we've just begun. Philippians 1, 4 says this, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. When God has done, it will be better. So in 2020, though our theme for the church may change, may our heart for God not change. Would you abide in Jesus Christ? Not in a painful, God, I'm going to abide in you today, but God, I'm yours. I'll let you purify me. I'll position myself to be dependent upon you. I'll, I'll let you prune me. Can you make me profitable for your sake? May our church abide or continue in Jesus Christ. May each one of us continue in Christ. Muhammad Ali made this statement to a student who was seeking advice on making something of himself. He said this, stay in college, get the knowledge, and stay there until you're through. If they can make penicillin out of moldy bread, they can surely make something out of you. If they can make penicillin out of moldy bread, then God can surely make something out of you and me. The master, husbandman, the true vine. If we continue in Jesus, we're profitable. Let's continue. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus, for the promise that you bring to us. And Lord, may our hearts be turned towards you. May our minds, Lord, give you the place they need. Lord, may we be profitable because we depend upon you and abide in you. All oh, in just a moment, the instruments we'll play will stand to our feet. But I wonder tonight if you need to come back and once again commit to a continue to abide in Jesus. Maybe you've come to the place where you're just doing it all yourself. Working, living your life, saving, planning. You need to come back and say, Jesus, I just need to abide in you. Take what I have and do something with it. My prayer, my challenge is for us to continue. Lord, bless this invitation. Guide us in Jesus' name. Amen.